what is like a crystallizing experience for that is to have a kid that does not understand at all what strength and conditioning is, doesn't care how much the boys squatted, doesn't care how many games the team won last year, doesn't care what somebody on the internet said about you or didn't say about you. So would I sacrifice his development and him succeeding or being happy as a person for a perfect winning season and all of my guys squatting 600 pounds? Not in a million fucking years. That's what's important. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, your number one fitness and performance resource in Switzerland. Today, I'll be chatting with Kier Wenham Flat, the founder of RugbyStrengthCoach.com and StrengthCoachNetwork.com. Kier is a performance coach with a decade of experience in elite and professional rugby in the UK, Australia, Japan, and Argentina. He now works as the coordinator of football performance at William and Mary College in Williamsburg, Virginia. Hey, Kier, thanks for coming on the show, man. Merci. <laughs> and is it Italian as well? <laughs> yeah, you could go grazie as well. Yeah, uh, grazie mille. <laughs> yeah, exactly, for the Italian part, so you get all three. Yeah, actually, right. you, you would have to say it in Romance if you wanted to get all four national languages in, but honestly, oh, I really? can't. Yeah, yeah, we have four. We have the, the French, the German, or Swiss German, Swiss Italian, and the Romance, which is spoken on the far eastern part of the country in the mountains, um, wow. but I don't know any of it, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right, so to give a little bit of context for how this interview is going to go, uh, you recently started uh, the Strength Coach Network podcast, which is different than the Rugby Strength Coach uh, podcast, where you actually interview people that are completely outside of the training world uh, in order to give a unique perspective on some of the important kind of underlying principles that can carry over into the performance field, which I find really interesting. So I thought it would be interesting to use that framework with you today and stay away from the on-field type questions that you usually get on Instagram to instead focus on topics such as business education, decision-making, and communication to give you a chance to kind of expand on your outlook on those and your philosophy. Sounds good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So I'll start with a two-part question. Uh, first part being starting with, your early, with you early in your career. Um, what questions or principles oriented your decision-making back then? And the second part would be how has your decision-making process changed or evolved since then? Well, they didn't. That's why I sucked. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, it's, it's a good question. You know, I think everyone, certainly initially in the beginning of their career, they, it's like the analogy I've heard is like someone's told you that there's a million dollars underneath a rock outside in this massive field that's full of rocks. And you, you know, turn over one rock, no, it's not there. Turn over another, no, it's not there. And you go through these stages in your career of, is it, is it strength? No, it's not strength. Is it power? No, it's not power. Is it speed? No, it's not speed. And then it's, it's what, what you understand uh, eventually, I think. And well, I, I hope that, you know, as coaches continue on that, that thought process, um, they, they mostly come to the conclusion that, really what we're doing is just human behavior because unless you live in North Korea, you have to persuade somebody to do what is in their own best interest to do. And you can discuss the detail of what stuff they should be doing, but ultimately programs are going to be limited by the adherence and your ability to persuade others to do what's, what's in their own best interest. And then I was at a conference. It was the USA football conference about 18 months ago. And a guy from the Miami Dolphins said, when you think about it, sport is just high, high pressure decision making repeated again and again for three hours in the case of football. And that combined with the book Principles by Ray Dalio, which, you know, I, I, I think I discovered through the Tim Ferriss podcast about two years ago. And everybody I speak to, I tell them to read it. It, it basically forces you to realize um, and along with Shane Parrish from the, I think it's called the Knowledge Project podcast, but it makes you realize that the person with the most accurate model of reality typically wins. And obviously the faster you can go through that cycle, but it's basically everything in life, you're starting out with an assumption and then you test that assumption. And then assuming you don't get removed from the gene pool, which is another conversation that we can have, you are going to get either positive reinforcement in the form of success, or you're going to get negative reinforcement in the form of failure. And the, the more closely your model of reality lines up with what is actually true, 
the more you're going to be able to discern the reasons that you failed or succeeded. You are going to be more equipped to understand the factors that contribute to success. And then you're going to draw on your experience and all that kind of stuff to, to come up with ways that you can tweak the system in your favor. And then you just run through that loop again. And one coming to the realization of that as a coach is really, really powerful. And then two, the more you go through that loop, the better you get at what you do. And, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, I, I like, uh, tech companies because it's really clear whether they failed or didn't fail. And the, the motto at Facebook, putting aside all the political stuff they do is move fast and break stuff. And it's not necessarily because they had the best product to begin with. If you looked at Facebook now compared to Facebook in 2004, 2005, it'd be terrible. But in tech, what you're given is the ability to test, you know, 10,000, a hundred thousand times a day, whether something works or not. And then they, they adapt quickly. So, you know, I think I, I actually worked out the numbers, uh, a 0.01% improvement every single day repeated for 10 years outstrips a hundred percent improvement after 10 years within three years. So it's, it's not necessarily the biggest changes. It's those incremental changes that you build upon and repeat and repeat and repeat every single day. Is that, that's what I try to do now. Is that something that you did in your, so not necessarily as a coach with your athletes or in the different jobs that you had as a coach, but you as a person, when it came to having a job and then deciding what job was the right one and then orienting your, your career in the performance field, is that the same process that you went through in terms of making fast decisions, moving fast when you had to, or how did you think in, in those terms? Um, I think it is, it's easier to do to an extent with athletes because you're just running all those little experiments every single day and you, you you're not going to tell tell the boys but i always say the first experiment is on yourself the second is on a long-term injured person because they'll do anything to come back then you go to the senior players then you go to everyone else and then maybe you'll have like a couple of stragglers that will either they'll they'll see the light or you'll just remove them so you're always running experiments with the athletes and you know it can be it can be harder in the initial stages of the career because you're always you, you can succumb to that temptation to program hop and change everything and say, right, you know, we have to scrap that, you know, everything. But when you change 10 different things, you're measuring the impact of 10 different things combined. And it can be hard to discern that the change that you saw was a, as a result of one different thing. So even though you have that temptation, it's definitely an incremental approach where you just tweak and, and try and evolve over time, I think is more productive in terms of, of training and, you know, people have asked me a lot over the last, let me think, eight years, what it was that I got out from Exos. I had a, an affiliation with Exos for a number of years, and it was basically the ability to organize my thoughts and to, and to have a framework where everything that gets added to the program, the way that they would phrase it is they're not going to just judge it on the merits. They're going to look at the merits and they're going to say, where does this fit into the program? And only if it does fit, then they're going to test it. They're not going to throw out the baby with the bathwater and then try another approach. But then when it comes to, to my own career, I think because it's more personal to you, it's harder to be quite so clinical. Um, you know, your own career is like one of these like emotional things. And there's definitely been times in my career where, I may be held on a little bit too long doing some stuff because of emotional reasons rather than uh, rational, logical reasons or, or vice versa. Um, but I think certainly the more successful coaches that I do know have a strategic approach to their career development where they're trying to reverse engineer uh, what it is they want to achieve. And a lot of coaches that you speak to, they can't even tell you in concrete terms what it is they want to achieve. And if you were to say to them in training, you know, do you agree that the training program that you, you should design needs to be directly related towards the desired end state? And they'd be like, of course. And say, right, if you don't have a desired end state, you've got a shit program, right? And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I say, right, okay, what is it you're working towards? And they'll go, uh, uh, uh. So in, in order to orient behavior and decision-making, you have to have a, a stated final destination to then work backwards from. 
Yeah, I was I was going to ask you that later on, but it's a good segue. Oh, yeah. So, what's what's your what's your end game? Um, my end game. When I came to the US, I was very vocal about saying I I want to work in the NFL because what it is, I had. This is this has actually been a somewhat of a flaw for me as a coach was that I was very. Uh, you know, I put a time limit on myself. I want to achieve this by this date and then I'll be happy. So you almost like tell yourself that story of, well, if I achieve this, I'm going to be happy. And then you do it and you're like, no. So, you know, when I started as an intern, I actually started as an intern 10 years ago, uh, the end of this month. So in about nine days, it'll be 10 years to the day that I became an intern. And when I came in, I was like, if I could just get any kind of paid job as a strength coach, I'll be over the moon. And I got it and I was like, no, nah, not enough. And I was like, right, now I want to work with a senior team. Didn't get it, got ahead of it. You know, I was ahead of an academy team in the premiership but by 26. And I was like, no, nope, not enough. You know, within a year, I was, well, within that year, I was working for Argentina and I was sulking because it was a temporary contract and I wasn't running the show. Then I went to Sydney Roosters and I was, you know, got bumped up to the senior coach within three weeks. Then it was like, well, I didn't have complete control. So I wasn't happy. And, and, you know, it, it culminated in when I started the internship, I said, I want to be a head strength coach in the premiership by the age of 30. So I did Sydney Roosters at 28. Then we went to the World Cup and I turned 30 at the World Cup and we came uh, fourth. And I was kind of like, what do I do now? And, you know, a bunch of stuff had, uh, had fallen into place where there was a, a contractual issue between Exos and the union, which meant that the non-compete clause said that I couldn't work for them. So my, my intention was to stay on with them and do super and all that kind of stuff. And I would have gone to the World Cup just past, but it didn't happen. And I ended up in Japan. You know, I got offered a lot of money to go to Japan for, for a two-year contract out there. And it helped that I was like flavor of the month because of the way that Argentina had played at the World Cup. But about halfway through that, I was like, you know, I'm, ne I'm never going to go back to a World Cup. Uh, I don't think so. They they did ask me to come back after a year, but it was just the, the time had passed, and I didn't want to didn't want to spend a year repairing what I thought was damage done to the program. I looked at the group stages, and I was like, I don't think they're going to get out of the group. I'm like, I'm not going to attach myself to it. So then I decided like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to try and work in the NFL. And it was kind of like, well, if you can make it as a foreigner in the NFL, you can make it anywhere, kind of thing. And it was just another goal to. Uh, to achieve. So then I set about, it took me over a year to get the visa, you know, $10,000 in lawyers fees and all that kind of stuff. It was a very expensive process. And I got over here and within, I think it was 10 months, I got, I got promoted to a coordinator of uh, football performance at the college I'm at now. Um, that coincided with the birth of my son. So I would still love to work in the NFL, but there's that second consideration of my son you know i'm certainly not going to try and chase a job at the expense of being in my son's life uh there's also um you know the, the the freedom to do work on your terms and speak your mind and stuff like that and that's that's i think the longer i'm in strength and conditioning the more i realize how valuable it is to me to be able to speak my mind and then structure the, my work the way that i want which can make me a little bit unpopular, but you know, I've, I'm not going to sell myself out and, and shut my mouth and do things that I don't believe in for the sake of other people. And then other people in the field have also said to me that actually they're quite jealous that I do do that. <laughs> so yeah, that's basically it. That was a long answer. Now that was, that was good. And, and I might, I might be wrong in saying that, but what you just kind of outlined is for me is, and, and I, I haven't had as many experiences and they haven't necessarily been in the performance field, but I feel like you have that entrepreneurial mindset where you are great at doing things the way you see them. I mean, talk about strength, uh, rugby strength coach, strength coach network. You've started two. Um, I don't know if they're separate entities in terms of companies, but you've started two separate entities already that are uh, very successful. I mean, from my point of view, from the outside anyway, eh, we're getting there. Right. Um, yeah. And in the meantime, you're trying to fit into all those other boxes along the way, but you never really find that it's like, it's like fitting a square peg in a, in a round hole. Like it's, it, it never really fits. Do you, do you kind of feel that way about your, your. Oh yeah. 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 Like I, 
I think there, there's been a bunch of experiences that were quite formative for me. Uh, one, definitely, how old are you? Are you in, you in your 20s still? 31. 31, okay. So I graduated at, at the time that the financial crisis of 2008 hit. Worst time possible to be joining the workforce and being an adult. <laughs> and in, in the UK, people my age are known as the lost generation because my belief, and I would argue it, is my parents' generation were the last generation where you could go to school, go to college, get a job. And then if you shut your mouth and did as you were told and you were loyal, they would look after you and then you got to retire at 65 and everything would be okay. That is absolutely not the case. It's absolutely not the case in sport. So in the real world, when you take on huge amounts of risk and competition, there's massive reward. So is it risky to be an investment banker? Is it a cutthroat industry where you have to work and work and work? Yes, it is. But guess what? They pay you a fortune. Strength and conditioning has all of the risk, all of the competition, and none of the reward. So you absolutely have to make yourself robust to that. So, you know, the, the general economic environment for our generation compared to our parents' generation is you absolutely have to look after yourself because nobody's going to look after yourself. And then the second thing is, is when you enter a field like strength and conditioning, you have to understand that competition in the marketplace between individuals increases the quality of service offered to consumers for a lower price. This phone right here, if you bought the handset outright, would cost about seven to $800. The first iPhone, which is a piece of shit compared to this, 10 years ago plus cost over $1,000. So it's probably worth more than double that in 2020 dollars. So why is it that I can get 10 times the tech for half the price? It's because of competition in the marketplace and strength coaches who think that the wages are going to go up as they compete with one another in the race to the bottom are absolutely fooling themselves. You know, I had a, I had a discussion with another coach about this the other day. His opinion was that establishing a chartered status for strength and conditioning coaches and a national minimum wage is somehow going to increase the wages for strength coaches. And I said, you're absolutely right. It will for the select few that actually have those paid jobs. Because if you tell me as a, an institution, I have to pay this, all I'm going to do is cut the number of coaches that I have in paid positions and increase the number of interns that I have working for free. So all you've done is just transfer more wealth to fewer people and then increase the people that work for, for free at the bottom. And it's basically, he said, well, you know, we have to unionize and we have to, we have to dictate to the governing bodies, you know, this is the wage for a strength coach. But my response was, if I buy a house from you, should I let the seller tell me the worth of the house? Or should I just look at the marketplace and be like, actually, I'm going to pay what the market's paying. So strength and conditioning is a, is a fantastic field. It's awesome fun. It's very, very hard work, but it is absolutely unforgiving. And you have to go in with your eyes open and position yourself in such a way that you are robust to the tough times. And it's basically all tough times. You spend a year working for free. You spend a year working for shit money. Maybe you get a full-time job and then you're earning about the same that if you just went into uh, realty out of high school without the student debt. You climb the ladder, you get the big payday of six figures plus. But once you get to that, it doesn't make up for the previous 10 years and you're now in a position where you can get fired like that. So you have to go in with your eyes open and say, actually, I, I think the best way to coach is when you don't have to because the freedom that you can speak with and make choices, not out of fear, but out because it's the right thing to do, or you think it's the right thing to do. That's what I'm trying to work towards. It, in your mind, you've been pretty vocal about coaching or coaches education as such mm -hmm. and what it entails and what, what's missing out of it. Do you yeah. find, do you think that there's anything that could be added to the curriculum, whether it's, you know, whether it's the NSCA, whether it's other, you talked about Exos quite a bit. Um, you talk about the, the UK as well uh, and, and what they provide or, or don't provide in terms of um, their education. Is there anything that we could add to those kind of um, the first steps that coaches are going to take that would increase the likelihood of the coaches going through the system to actually succeed on the other end? 
Yeah, well, let me, I'll put it this way, right? If you went to a teaching hospital for a minor dental surgery, would you be comfortable with a fifth year dental student performing a filling on you under supervision? Probably, yeah. Yeah, because dentistry, the idea of dentistry is to, at the end of five years, is to produce junior dentists that can work productively in the field under supervision, okay? Would you be comfortable with a third year or fourth year kinesiology student running a group of 30 junior athletes and producing a highly effective session? No, I don't know. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, it is very, very, very rare. Right. So the fact that there is a disconnect there, you say, oh, you know, I've got, I've got no problem with a junior dentist probing around my mouth. I've got no problem with a junior doctor doing this. I've got no problem with a pilot flying a plane at the end of their course under supervision. Why is it that we have strength and conditioning coaches coming off the conveyor belt that are four years and ten, tens of thousands of dollars deep that do not know how to do the most basic coaching? So I put it another way on Twitter today. I said, look at the cost of a, of a four-year degree in kinesiology, sports science, strength and conditioning, and ask yourself, if you spent that amount of money to fly to Havana and you just apprenticed at the Cuban Olympic Association for four years, in which situation do you think you would be a better coach? The degree or going to Cuba? And everyone have said, oh, you know, Cuba, uh, sorry, oh, the degree. And it's bullshit. If you surrounded yourself with elite coaches and athletes and you coached every single day, 10 hours a day, and then you just got a library card and access to the internet, which is maybe restricted in Cuba, but anyway, <laughs> if you were presented with tasks on day one that were the limit of your ability, and then you got a little bit better, you did more, 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 you'd be a, you'd be a very, very good coach at the end of those four years. Um, and this is not me throwing stones at people because when I graduated, I was a terrible coach, and I learned the hard way. I, I've never stood in front of a group of athletes and actively coached a group of athletes. I was a researcher. I was like an armchair sports scientist. I was not a coach. So when, when you get to be a director of a department or you know, private facility, whatever, and you are hiring aspiring strength coaches, there is no ability whatsoever to discern between who's going to be a good coach and who's going to be a bad coach, depending on the degree that they have and the accreditation that they have. Some of the worst coaches I've ever seen had all the degrees, you know, all the accreditations. I've got a guy sat right here, Terence. He interned with me in Tokyo. He was an undergrad. He didn't even finish his degree. He had no accreditations. And within three years was working in professional baseball. So the fact that that can happen, there's a massive disconnect between what higher education says you need to coach what the accrediting bodies say you need to coach and what professional sport or performance sport says. And those three need to get on the same page and adopt that kind of uh, medical dentistry model of apprenticeship. Because to me, the more practical a discipline is, the more practice has to come into the learning experience. And most, most uh, strength and conditioning kinesiology, kinesiology students never stand in front of a group of athletes until year four. So when, when those, those people are in school, when they're learning um, until, until the, f the system gets fixed from the outside or from the inside, what should they be looking to do while they're studying in order to get that practical experience that is going to make them better coaches in the end? Go find the lowest, or no, let me rephrase. Go find the highest level of athlete that will still derive value from your coaching and that will let you. Because the chances are, you know, if you go in as a first year undergrad and you, you go down the road to Manchester United or Manchester City and say, oh, I'm, you know, I'd like to get some experience. I'll say, okay, there's your experience. But if you, if you keep dropping that level, dropping that level, dropping that level, eventually someone is going to, one, agree to you coaching and two, put their hand in their pocket for you. When, before I uh, interned at London Wasps, I was coaching my own rugby team or another rugby team in the town for like 50 pounds a session but I was coaching. And then as your ability increases, you can move on to bigger challenges and be paid more for your work. But you know, you, you get better coaching by coaching. 
So you, you have to find, and even, even if it's a personal trainer, it's still coaching. It's not the coaching you want, but it's coaching. Yeah. What, what do you do of uh, strength and conditioning coaches that are starting out and that kind of look down on, on personal training and say, ah, I don't, that's not really what I want to do. So I'm, I'm not even going to pay attention to it. I just want to, you know, work with elite athletes and, and all that and all that. Expect to be poor. You know, Mike, Mike Boyle's facility makes millions a year. And I would say a huge chunk of his money comes from general population. If you look at all of the notable facilities in the US, either lose money or they pad out the money with uh, gen pop training. Exos makes next to nothing. They make all their money in education um, and business. Um, Juggernaut closed down the first time. Mike Boyle does huge amounts of money doing general population. Cressy, I couldn't say. I know um, Mike Guadango at Freak Strength. He does actually make a lot of money, but he still makes a ton of money from Gen Pop. So, you know, I read a, a quote on on Twitter the other day that America, in particular, is so status obsessed. You know, you have a receptionist on twenty five thousand dollars a year, looking down her nose at a pipe fitter that makes six figures a year that's come to to fix a repair. And, you know, I, uh, I got another tattoo like last week, the guy that did that tattoo dropped out of high school and gets paid $2,000 a day and wears a Rolex. So <laughs> I've got two degrees and I'm paying him two grand a day. Am I, am I, am I smart or is he smart? <laughs> so yeah. I would not look down your nose because if you're in the right city, you know, in, in Switzerland, you're probably looking at like, what, 150 bucks an hour to be a personal trainer. It's, it's easy close. money. Pretty close. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's it's definitely it's definitely personally it's definitely where where I make my living, and then for now the the the, the physical prep with the rugby is 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 more of the fun and the experience for me. Although I yeah. I do you know talk a lot about it, but it's definitely not like this is not what's paying the bills yeah. right now. Well, in um, Hollywood, there's this thing in Hollywood they call it one for me and one for the man. So if you're an actor the one for you, that's your passion project, that's for your art that you derive the enjoyment and the sense of purpose from. And then the one for the man is the, is the studio picture that you do that generates all the money, that earns you the right to do the next art house project. And that's, that's how I look at it is, you know, one for you is the, the performance sport and then one for the man is the commercial training or the stuff that makes money on the side. Yeah, and I guess if you're able to enjoy both, then you're living a pretty good life. That's it, yeah. You, a while ago, I remember you recommending a really good book that I really enjoyed uh, called Never Eat Alone. Um, yeah. Talked about making connections, which I think is, is definitely very, very important in, in any industry that you, that you evolve in. Um, for, again, some of the, the, the up and coming coaches out there that want to make connections but don't really know where to start, what are some of the most practical steps that you were able to extract from that book and apply to your own path? You know, I tell people without exaggeration that book really did change my life because because i'm stubborn i had decided that oh people people are going to hire me just on the merit of my work and how intelligent i am and blah 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 until uh nine years ago i had interviewed for a job put my heart and soul into the practical tasks uh just mapped out what at the time was the very limit of my ability and you know, organization and all these plans that I had for this rugby club and presented. And then the feedback was that, well, we thought, you know, technically you were, you were better at the task and you had, you know, more knowledge and blah, blah, blah. And I'd actually done a two week trial period as the interim and I didn't get it. And, you know, they fed me a lot of reasons as to why they didn't make that choice. And, it felt like bullshit. And I can tell you having worked at that club as an assistant after that, it was bullshit in my opinion. And the, the coaching question actually said to another uh, colleague, he said one of the biggest regrets in his career is he didn't hire me. So, um, but the guy that he did hire best man at his wedding, best friend, absolutely tight like that went to university together. And I realized I am, I don't want to be, the principled guy with the great ideas, but no job. There's no, there's no rule that says you have to be a bad coach if you're going to be liked and respected and trusted and have connections. You can be both. 
And you absolutely should work on both of those because all things being equal, people want to work with individuals that they know, like, and trust. And all things not being equal, they still want to work with people that they know, like, and trust. So who you know typically is going to get you through the door and what you know is going to keep you there. And it doesn't matter what you know if you're not there first. You have to get selected for that job. So he talks about, Keith Barazzi talks about in that book, it's almost like a muscle that has to be worked. So you should, you, there's no shame in asking for a favor. If you, if you don't ask, you don't get. I had an, an intern that I worked with at Richmond literally last week. And he said, I'm ringing up to ask for help. And within 10 minutes, I'd connected him to three people and it might end up in a job for him. And it, it, it's a two-way street. You shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be afraid to ask people for help and to be quite honest about it. And you also shouldn't be afraid to, to help people because the way that I look at it is every person that you meet, you should try and help them in, in some regard. You should, le- you should uh, leverage your knowledge, skills, experience, and connections. And it's like planting a seed. The worst time to ask for a favor is when you've done nothing for that person because human beings are reciprocal. If I do something for you, you're more likely to do something for me. If you read the book, Influence, that's one of the things he talks about. But if you're selfish and calculate, you'll say, oh, well, how do I know who's the person that I'm going to have to ask for a favor down the line? And the answer is you don't. So what you do is every person you meet, plant a seed, help them out, and then if and when the time comes that you do need to ask for a favor, you've already helped that person and it's probably going to result in a positive outcome for you. And even if you don't, you've helped every person that you've met. Yeah. That's, that's the power of that. Yeah. Like I like the analogy of the bridge, the relationship is a bridge and you have to build 51% at least right off the bat. Uh, yeah. Because like you said, it's not necessarily in the, in the mind mindset of, Oh, I'm going to do more because then I know that they're going to do it back. That's not the right, the right way to go into it. But if you do more one, if you ever need help, like you said, you, you can ask because yeah. you've actually done the, the first steps and done the, the extra, you know, the extra 10%, like we say, but also, you know, when all is said and done, if you look back on what you did, did you, did you try to shortchange every person that you met or did you actually just go above and beyond and do the right thing, which is, you know, try to be a good human being. Try. <laughs> try. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talked about your intern and you were intern uh, once as well. Uh, for people that are going through that process, what are the ways of getting the most out of your internship? You ever heard the phrase, you have to dress for the job that you want? Uh, no. So, you know, in English, the phrase is you, you dress for the job that you want. So, you know, if you, if you turn up to uh, an interview for a clerical job, dress like a garbage man, don't be surprised when they treat you like a garbage man. You know, they're not going to give you, you know, you have to act the part. And I would say the same applies when you're an intern, you have to act for the job that you want. If you conduct yourself on the level of an intern, which is in most places, unfortunately, is an unpaid cleaner. And, you know, you get the cones out, you take the cones back in, you do the piss test, all that kind of stuff. Do not be surprised when at the end of that, that is all that you're qualified to do. And that's what they're willing to pay you to do, which is nothing. So one of the things that I tried to do coming into my internship as well, and this is another thing is rightly or wrongly, it was wrong. London Wasps 10 years ago, if you were an intern, they used to call the interns the hobbits because they were these little people that used to come out and like get all the stuff. And they were basically the bottom level of society. And when you're the intern for the academy, you're a level lower than those guys. So I used to have my mindset was I'm not, I'm not a hobbit. I'm not an intern. I'm an unpaid coach. So I'm going to do all of the intern stuff, but the internship begins when that stuff is done because that's the stuff that's going to distinguish you from the other people. And that's, what's going to convey value to the organization that says, actually, we want to keep this person. We want to reward them with a job. So people have it flipped is they ask for a reward and then promise to show value on the back end. It doesn't work that way. You show value, then you're rewarded, hopefully. So that was the mindset that I tried to take is I'm going to do the same as everyone else, but then I'm going to do more on top 
and that's where I'm going to win the internship or win, win the job. And the question that I ask myself, I try to ask myself at every place I go, and of course it's going to vary as, as I climb the ladder, which is what's my legacy going to be when I leave here? What will they point to and say, that was kids? And that's, that's what I tried to do. And it, it may have been small things, but there are, there are kids, you know, they're, kids, they're in their mid-20s now. There are kids that I work with 10 years ago that I still speak to. And they still ask me questions. So I, I know just from that, that I, you know, with those kids, I must have done a good job and I must have had some kind of legacy at that place. You, you talked about, you know, moving up the, moving up the, prover, the proverbial ladder. So uh, first as an assistant and then as a head strength coach, what were the harder things that you had to do uh, in your job as a strength and conditioning coach with, uh, with a team? Like the technical duties or like how the kind of like the mindset? More on the mindset side. I mean, the mindset is when you're an assistant, it, it, it can be tough because, I mean, it's tough at every level, but there, there's definitely a mindset shift that has to occur with when you're an assistant, you get afforded the luxury a little bit more of being able to switch off when you leave. And it's, you know, the phrase shit rolls downhill. You have people above you blocking that shit. So you're not going to have to deal quite so much with infighting, politics, uh, backstabbing people coming for you and stuff like that. Uh, the price that you pay in exchange for that is you're going to get less money and you also get a little bit less of a say in terms of the direction of the program. So your job is more of a facilitator. That's not to say that, you know, if I'm ahead now that I'm going to be extremely prescriptive to the guys that work for me, because one of the things, if you read Malcolm Gladwell in outliers is, one of the major drivers for people to have motivation and to succeed is autonomy and a clear return between effort and reward. So at most as a, as a head now, what I try and provide is guidelines to the guys that I work with. And I, I would talk to them about what is the desired outcome that I want. You can try and achieve that any way that you want, but once a semester as a staff, we're going to sit down and say, not, pick holes but we're gonna say why did you do this why did you do that what were the results how did it compare to everyone else's what could you incorporate all that kind of stuff um and when you become ahead you are it's almost flipped you're gonna to have to deal with this shit you're gonna to have to deal with the backstabbing you're gonna to have to speak to um unwilling sport coaches you're gonna get a little bit more money but that job is gonna follow you home um at the end of the day and it's a lot more you're a lot more of a technician as an assistant you can actually lose yourself in the detail of the job and um tweaking this tweaking that and be really focused on the results but once you get to the head level it's a lot more about um cloning yourself so typically the best strength coach in the room rises to be head strength coach but once you get to head strength coach level, how good of a coach you are really has very little to do with it. It's more about how do you get what's in your head and get it to the people working with you uh, so that you can clone those processes and have a, a fairly uniform delivery of training to all of the athletes that you, you have in, in, your, in your care. And then getting all of the individuals within that high performance um, infrastructure that, that have contact with the athlete to work together. Typically in an organization, it's going to be the, the head strength coach or the, the high performance director that coordinates all of the athlete stakeholders. And that's a very different job and a very different skill set to being a, uh, in the gym technician. It doesn't say, it doesn't mean that you can lose that technician quality, but it's certainly not going to be predictive of success as a head. It's, it's definitely, it's, it's more of a manager leader kind of job more than anything else. Exactly. Right? You, you, you end up becoming a generalist again. So you, you start a generalist, you, you have your likes and dislikes, you become a specialist and you say, all right, that's my thing. I'm going to be the insert word guy. And then when you become ahead again, you have to put that to one side and become the generalist again, because you're going to be working with people that have broad responsibilities and skill sets. How do you, or did you, when you were head of strength and conditioning in the different 
clubs and organizations that you went through. How did you deal with the, the politics, the backstabbing, the, the, the talking and all of that? It's tough. It's tough. I think a de- uh, it, you know, in any organization, the person that is willing to walk away from it all with a blink of an eye is a dangerous individual to deal with. You need to build that into your life. Either because you're such a fucking lunatic that it really doesn't matter and you can just walk away from nothing or you have income security, self-worth, all that kind of stuff built into your life outside of that job so that if it was to crumble tomorrow, you wouldn't even feel it. You do have to, you know, that's, that's one thing. I think you have to also develop a thick skin because everybody is the hero of their own movie, never the villain. So every individual that interacts uh, with you and it's a difficult interaction, they think they're right. So you have to, you have to bear that in mind and look at it for what it is rather than take it quite so personally. Um, I've had difficult interactions with people that I've worked with and I'm on very good terms now, but they were very tough at the time. And it takes going through that a couple of times to look back on it with hindsight and to uh, detach yourself from it a little bit. And then I think, you know, you also do have to be somewhat strategic about understanding if there are people with ulterior, uh, ulterior motives, less than honorable intentions to not attach yourself to certain people like that, to avoid them um, where necessary. If you have the power to uh, make sure that other people don't interact with them or that person's not in the organization, do that as well. But I think it's, it's a blend. You have to try and uh, work with good intention and everything. You have to try and make yourself as robust as possible. And then you also do have to be strategic. You can't be naive. Is there an expiry date to being a strength and conditioning coach, whether it's at the amateur level, at the pro level? Do you think that one can succeed long-term in one organization or not? There's absolutely an expiry date. Um, it's going to depend on a number of factors. For... It's, it's almost like, you know, like uh, in like space movies, they talk about like an escape velocity. Like you have to hit a certain velocity to get into orbit and then you can relax a little bit. That it, in strength and conditioning, it's financial. You know, you can't be, unless you really, 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 really want it. You can't be 35 and 40 years old and working for free. So at some point, I think a lot of coaches are going to realize, you know, I've been doing this for X number of years and I'm still not getting where I want to be. Maybe it's not for me. Uh, That's one thing. I think the nature of the job in a lot of different um, sports and professional setups is just not conducive to what some people value in their lives. So family, uh, wife, children, time to yourself of uh, building security for the future is, for example, not conducive with uh, Premier League soccer, um, NBA, all that kind of stuff. When you look to coaches that are able to do that long-term and they're not divorced, typically they have built a system around them that allows them to spend a little bit more time away from the job or to have a little bit more time at home and a bit more structure. So for example, college football, you're gonna play 13 games, half of them will be away. That's only seven weeks a year that you're on the road. It's very, very different to the NBA or EPL or or stuff like that. Um, The problem, well, you know, the the, the flip side to that is most coaches are gonna move every, you know, one to three years in college football, because it's just the, it's the, the carousel, the merry-go-round. Head coach gets fired, head coach gets a new job, you follow the head coach, blah, blah, blah. And that's also, you know, if you, if you do have kids, are you really gonna move your kids to a different school every one to three years for the sake of your career? Some people would say yes, some people would say no. If you strike it lucky, and you're one of those coaches where 
the head coach is locked in, head coach is not going anywhere. Typically, it's going to be with a school or organization which is content to have a 500 uh, win rate every year, kind of in the middle. Um, you, you can spend a long time at a club. One of the things that I, I personally don't like about that is you get very, very comfortable and you cease to have to justify your own existence. So I always think there's, there's two paths to career development as a strength coach. One is that you can move every two to four years because the perception of you as an individual can be fixed at certain clubs. And simply by moving, you can increase your pay and you can change the way that people perceive you and not have that be a limit on your career. The second is that you can be the bottom guy. Somebody gets fired, you move up a step. Somebody gets fired, move up another step again, 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 until you become the head guy. That can be a lot easier in terms of the stuff outside of work, in terms of your life. However, you typically have to understand that when you do that, you're, you're hitching your wagon to a head coach and you only have a job as long as that head coach has one. What happens is, as well is when you become so-and-so's guy, you actually rob yourself of the opportunity to engage with reality because you're not keeping your job based on how good you are or the results you produce. You're keeping your job based on the other guy. And personally, I don't like that. I would still, if I worked with a head coach that liked me, want a contract of a fixed duration and have to justify my existence. But that's just me. How many times did you quit in your career and why? I quit. Uh, so I told you earlier that the, the team where I was an assistant, I, I quit that mm. midway through the the, the con or midway through the season because I basically I'd read the book uh, four hour work week so I was like 80% of the money 80% of the knowledge 80% of the experience is coming from 20% of my time and the other is just a headache and I looked at this club and I was like I'm not learning anything I know I got stiff for the job I'm not learning anything I'm not enjoying it um, my hands are being tired and being forced to do certain things at a job so i quit that um and i think i'd read a book by seth godin um i i used to read well i i used to download pirated audiobooks via BitTorrent and listen to them on my <laughs> my phone when i would commute to work like an hour each way and one of the things that i think i read about that seth godin written about is there's no shame in quitting early if you quit early it's good Try it, don't like it, quit, move on. What you're, look, you're not looking to get a few years into something and then decide to quit. If you're going to quit, quit early. If you know that you want to do something long-term, stick with it and work hard. So that was one example. I quit as well. Um, Sydney Roosters, it was a terrible experience for me. I had become so uh, fixated on my goal of what it is I wanted to do before the age of 30. But I took a job where it was not right for me to take that job. And on paper, it was the world's best job for me. And in reality, it was horrible. And I caught myself one day writing out how much money I could save if I stayed for X amount of weeks and how much money I'd have at the end of it. And I thought, this is not good. And there was a blow up. And the next day I left. And uh, I, I never actually explicitly said it, but my boss at the time had rung me up and we had a heart to heart and he said, uh, you know, tell me your opinion. I told him stuff like that. He said, well, it sounds like you're quitting. And I said, you know what I am. And then I stayed two more days and then we did a, a game on the Friday and he said, you have big things in your future. And my reply to him was, I know I was supposed to do them here. And then the next year we got to the semifinal of the world cup and then I went to Japan. And so it was very, very tough at the time. Uh, and obviously it hurt my ego, but it was not the end. And I'm sure there's going to be more failure in my career, but it's basically, if you read, uh, Seneca, Seneca talks about, is this the condition that I feared? It basically, it, when you, when you quit, when you lose a job, when you have a very, very tough professional failure, you, you feel like it's the end of the world, but life, limb and liberty. If you're walking around, you're breathing, you've got a roof over your head, you've got food, you've got family that love you, the worst, worst, worst case scenario is you have to move back into your mom's house. But nobody is saying that you can't have another go. 
you know, if you look at all of these coaches out there, DUI, uh, assault, you know, financial misdeeds, improprieties, all this kind of stuff, they get another go. So if they get another go, you're probably going to get another go. Nobody says you can't try again. Switching gears a little bit, um, talking about amateur sports, I find it interesting that, or at least I think that in order to have an amateur team that, or an amateur club that runs well, the structure of said club needs to be professionally run. So how, how can we reconcile those, that dichotomy kind of between the, the, the status of the sport, there's, the players are not paid, there's not a lot of money, but we need a structure that is run really well so that the guys can just essentially have some fun on the weekend. What's the most fun thing of all? Winning. So it, it has to, pro professionalism is a mindset and a, a, a pattern of behaviors. It's not a, a price tag because I can tell you for a fact, Japanese rugby is the highest paid in the world and it is amateur as hell. Amateur. It's just club rugby with millions of dollars. You know, you, you have guys who work in the factory in the day. They'll go to work 9 a.m. They'll work until 3 p.m. They'll come and they'll train before and after. And because they have that day job and they have the mentality of, well, I'm an amateur, they'll go out and drink three nights a week and I want to do this and I want to do that. When we went to the 2015 Rugby World Cup, there were numerous players that you would know of, like Santiago Cordero, um, Matias Moroni, uh, Guido Petty, all those guys had never played a professional rugby game in their lives. Never. They were amateurs. So if you look at the behaviors, those guys were, they conducted themselves like professionals. It's a mindset. So are you going to have to make some sacrifices in terms of the professionalism because you have to do other stuff in your day job? Of course you are. But to me, it's a pattern of behaviors and it's, you're talking about priorities that you're uh, setting up for yourself. So every action, does this advance me closer towards my stated goal? Yes or no? If yes, do it. If not, no. So when you're making sacrifices outside of sport to get closer to the objective of success in sport, you're a professional. It doesn't matter how much you get paid. When the reverse is true, you're an amateur. And, you know, to your point, that occurs at the administrative level, it occurs at the, the financial level of, of amateur sports teams. But, um, yeah, that to me is what professionalism versus amateurism is all about. Not to say there's any shame in amateurism. Sport should be fun. But if you are there to only have fun and you're trying to run a professionally minded sports organization, get rid how can a how can a club or an organization go about establishing its core values like you talk about you know if our goal is winning then you know i think i think you talked about the is it the uk rowing that said you know does it make the boat move faster so yeah. how how do we get everybody on that same page in terms of uh, agreeing to what we actually want out of this club out of this structure yeah. and how do we actually move forward all together what does it take so if you read a book called Top Dog, I forget the, the authors, but it's, it's basically a book about uh, competition and competitiveness. And if you look at world-class organizations, they have a thread of, of competitiveness throughout everything they do. Everyone in that organization loves to compete. They're comfortable with the scrutiny of competition and they encourage it and every, you know, they, they want to win in everything they do. And one of the things they talk about is uh, an organization is like a rocket ship. So in, when NASA launches a rocket, once that button gets pushed, there's no adjustments. If the rocket crashes, it's because of mistakes that were made before you push the button. So what you, when, you, when you're forming an organization, when you're assigning personnel within that organization, that's like all the preparation for the rocket. And you have to make sure that everything is set up right before you push that button. Because once you push the button, if something's wrong, it's on. Of course, and it explodes. So you absolutely have to look at who are the personnel that we're bringing into this organization because an, an organization is going to reflect the people in it and the values that they hold. 
So if you have like this, this brilliant minded CEO or, or head with just a bunch of assholes underneath him, the organization is going to take on the flavor of the assholes. So I think you have to, in terms of the people, you have to say, right, what are, what are the characteristics of elite performers? What are the values that they hold? What behaviors do they exhibit? And how do we measure and select for those behaviors in the personnel that we bring in? And one of the worst things I think you can do is compromise on that and just say, oh, well, we need this person to do this, this, this. If you can't find the right person, wait and, and say no. Then you, I think there's going to be some direction from the higher ups, but values don't become values until they're tested. Otherwise, they're just verbal preferences. So I think what you have to do as, as a team, you have to talk about what it is that you find important, why you get out of bed in the morning, what gives you a sense of purpose. And to Socrates, the beginning of wisdom lies in the definition of terms. What do you mean you know, to be tough? What do you mean about community and family? The amount of teams that have fired staff or cut them the second it got financially difficult that throw out throw around the word family this year is ridiculous to me they're not allowed to use that word anymore then it has to be that shared identity it has to be agreed upon and then there's going to be you know like a, a unique culture a unique identity i uh call runnings you know, don't ignore the Swiss, we're Jamaican. And I was talking to uh, some colleagues the other day and it was like, I think I was listening to a podcast, it's by the founder of LinkedIn. And he said, some people are the Navy and some people are pirates. Being a pirate is an identity. I think, especially in America and in college football, you have a lot of teams that want to copy this, copy that from other teams because they're successful, because people mistakenly associate that with the success. Whereas sometimes going against that can be an identity. And personally, I'm a pirate. I'm not the Navy. And I like it. You know, we're going to play girls just want to have fun in the gym. We're going to play girly music because if we, if I put up videos of us training to that and we beat you, how's that going to sting? You're not going to like it. So shame on you. And then I think everything that you do within the organization has to pass through that filter. Does it make the boat go faster? Because one of the worst things I think an organization can do is lose focus and try and be all things to all men. So it has to be, what is the objective? So for example, Japanese rugby, they want to be a corporate marketing exercise. They want to be a club sports team. They want to do community outreach. They want to be high performance sport. Not going to happen. You can be one of those things. And it's when you start to spread yourself too thin. I think that's when organizations lose their focus and they lose their momentum. Because really, when a staff comes in, you, they will be told the lie of, you know, oh, there's no, there's no time limit on this. There's no whatever. There is a time limit. You have to generate momentum incredibly quickly as a staff and as an organization for people to see the results from it and to take enthusiasm from that and to continue with it. And really, as a, as a leader or as a manager, you only get two times that you're allowed to be really bold. One is when you come in because they're not going to fire you within a few months because it makes them look bad. And the second is when you're winning. Any other time, you're going to have to probably hold back a little bit and not be able to take as cutthroat an action as you would like. So you have to strike when the iron is hot. And if I think about successful organizations, that I've been a part of and less successful organizations, successful organiza organizations will talk about what the values they are, what they hold to be important, what the standard of behavior is, and when that standard is met, it's rewarded publicly. And when that standard is not met, probably you're gonna get a warning the first time and the next time it happens, remove. You're literally removed from the group. I watched a <clears throat> coaching change uh, in Argentina the head coach came in. There were three or four players that had talked shit about that coach in the media after his appointment said, oh, you know, I'm not sure about this. And he stood him in a room and he said, 
one, two, three, four, you will never play for Argentina again. You're done. And that was it. And they were really good players. But they got cut. And, you know, in successful organizations I've been in, when, you know, a, a high-level player comes in, they turn up 15 minutes late. They just they get sent home, not training today. It's not personal. It's not because I hate you. It's just that's the standard of behavior. Turn up 15 minutes late, not going to train, come back tomorrow. And in less successful organizations, there's affordances made and the rules are bent and all this kind of stuff. Which, which makes it harder uh, in, the, in the grand scheme of things because you, you can't necessarily be like, well, you, you, and you, you go home because you're late, right? Yeah. Because then they'll say, oh, well, you didn't do it for this guy. Right. Or don't you know how important I am to this organization, that kind of stuff. And it just has to be blanket treatment. So, so how in, in, that, in that context, you talked about uh, establishing momentum uh, and then when you arrive, you can be bold. But how, what tools within the, the communication realm, what tools and strategies have you used to kind of get that buy-in from the group that you, that you roll in with uh, so that they, they, they are kind of on your side or at least understand what you're doing so that they're not going to just go against you for the sake of going against you. Yep. I think not to sound perfect. because you know, I've, I've had difficult characters I've dealt with that it takes a long time for them to, to come around to it. And, you know, I've got, uh, one guy's like, a, he, you, you know, famous, famous rugby player that you would have heard of. I used to fight tooth and nail with this guy when I worked with him. And now he messages me every couple of months like, oh, you know, I wish we were doing, you know, the stuff that we used to do and this is how I feel now and blah, 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 blah. I think they have to understand that what you're asking them to do is in their own best interest. And you want the same thing that they do because when they do good, you do good. When they do bad, you do bad. So if I'm asking you to do something, if you want to do something else, implicit in that assumption is that you know more about my job than I do for the most part, not to say that they're never right. They may have some input stuff like that. There's that. You also have to explain what you're doing to people because not everyone is going to take what you say on blind faith. They might do as they're told. It doesn't mean they're going to believe in it. And obviously you want them to believe and understand what they're doing. So they're going to attack it with the most amount of enthusiasm possible. It has to be, uh, facilitation as opposed to instruction. So, so I am trying to help you become a master of your sport and excel at what you do. And in order to do that, we can't have this hierarchical relationship where you can't question me and say, well, I disagree with this within reason. You should have the opportunity to say, well, I don't believe in it because of this reason. And you can say, okay, well, let's have a discussion. Let's get to the bottom of it. Let's establish who, who is right and why. And that discourse and trying to arrive at the truth together is probably what helps athletes to understand and go along with, with training. Um, that's at least one aspect of it. You do catch more flies with sugar than you do with shit. You have to make training enjoyable. So one of my colleagues sarcastically says that nothing builds buy-in like making people hate where they work. So the fake tough guy grind, rolling around in the dirt, all this bullshit. It makes people hate what they do. You have to, well, no, you don't have to. You should arrive to work every single day enthused to do what you do around the people that you work with and have joy in the training process. And you can, because, you know, over the long term, you're going to attack training with a lot more enthusiasm, a lot more productive effort, and you're going to adhere to, uh, guidelines and instruction way more if you enjoy it and you actually want to be there. So that's one thing that I try to do is I try to make people want to be there, which you actually don't speak to a lot of coaches They're like, Oh, this is the way that we try and make it fun. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one thing for sure. Switching gears a little bit. And you, t you mentioned that previously, but I'd like to, you to expand a little bit on it. Uh, coaching and family, uh, your son, uh, was born a little while ago. How did that change what you do and how do you make it work? How do you balance all that out? I don't. Um, it's uh, certainly, you know, one, one mistake I made in my career was I, I invested way too much of my self-worth 
or you know associated my self-worth with my professional achievements and i got away with it for quite a while because my you know if you look at my career trajectory i got very very lucky and i i planted a lot of seeds and every opportunity that came to me i said yes so i started as a profession i started as an intern an unpaid intern at professional club july 2010 by august 2013 i was working with argentina the national team and by october 2013 oh no november 2013 i was working with sydney roosters and by december 2013 i was the senior strength coach for sydney roosters by april 2014 i had nothing and all of a sudden you learn the hard way that you've been hinging your self-worth on your professional achievements because i felt like absolute shit so certainly as my career goes on i become a little bit less attached to what it is i do to derive self-worth as a person because i understand that it's gone bad in the past and it will go bad again it's just the nature of the business and to try and take worth from other stuff that i do and not take the tough times as emotionally it's still difficult because you have an ego and everyone has emotions, but to try and remove yourself a little bit from it. And what is like a crystallizing experience for that is to have a kid that does not understand at all what strength and conditioning is, doesn't care how much the boys squatted, doesn't care how many games the team won last year, doesn't care what somebody on the internet said about you or didn't say about you. So would I sacrifice his development and him succeeding or being happy as a person for a perfect winning season and all of my guys squatting 600 pounds, not in a million fucking years. That's what's important. So it's nice to be a strength coach. It's nice to have a, a fun job where I get to train around high performing athletes and stuff like that. But then the real prize to me would be to see him have a happy life and to, to get whatever it is he wants to do. It was uh, you know, a lot more it was complicated a lot more. He, uh, his mother and I are separated. So, you know, she left the USA last October. And that was basically, you know, I've, I've never said this publicly, like, but my mother had to come over. And for most of the season, I worked seven days a week and basically got up at like, five o'clock in the morning. My mother helped me look after the baby. He went to daycare. I picked him up, came home, and I just did that every single day for about 12 weeks. And then, you know, I'll, I'll probably end up having to do it again. But it, it, I'm not saying I've got the answers, but it was, I've managed to get through some of it somewhat last season, and I'm sure it's going to get even harder as I go on, but, you know, it's, it's very tough. What would be your advice to your younger self uh, when you started out coaching? I'm not sure I'd listen. Honestly, I'm not sure I'd listen. What would you say anyway? Um, I'd probably say it would, be, it would be conflicting advice. I would say relax. <laughs> and then I would say start sooner. Yeah, yeah but because... I think there's, there's, you know, I'm a big, big fan of uh, Peter Thiel and he talks a lot about people, people set, that they impose time limits on themselves. You know, I, I absolutely cannot do this until I've done this, 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 this. And it's bullshit. You know, you, you can, you can go out and be a head strength coach in a year. doesn't mean you're going to succeed. doesn't mean it's going to go well, but you can do it. And guess what? The easiest way to get a, a job as a head strength coach is to have already been a head strength coach. So I think, you know, I, I, when I've experienced the biggest jumps in my coaching development and learning experiences is when I bit off more than I could chew. And I was like, right, sink or swim. So I would do it sooner. And if you had to give yourself advice for you in the next 10 years, what would you say to yourself? Ownership is everything. I, like I, I was thinking about this the other day. I was going to write a tweet about it. I was like walking past a nightclub 
or uh, I think it was, a, uh, no, it was a pasta bar in New York. And I thought when I was 18 or like when I, when I was 17 or 18, couldn't get into bars. I thought, oh, it'd be really, really cool to be the bouncer on the door and to have the power be like, oh, this guy gets into the, the bar or not, or this girl gets into the bar or not. And then you realize that guy's earning shit money to stand outside in the cold and be a dickhead to people. And I thought, oh, it'd be really, really cool to, uh, to own the club and be in the club and be in the VIP section. When, when you get to like your early 20s, you're like, oh, it'd be awesome to own the club and be in the VIP section, all this kind of stuff and have everyone see you be the boss. And now I'm getting to be, I'm going to be 35 this year. I want to be the guy at home but with my family and my son having dinner and I own five nightclubs and everyone lining up outside is paying me money to be in the nightclub. And, you know, I just, uh, I just got an offer accepted on a, an apartment building. So I'm going to have an apartment building this year. I'm going to tr try and keep doing that. And it's like, I think in terms of not to say that money is everything, it doesn't buy happiness, but money buys you, um, freedom and it buys you options and it the, the more money you can make without exchanging hours for dollars i think that's very very important to build a kind of lifestyle that you want where you can turn things down and say well i don't want to do that and i'm not going to do it because i don't need the money and and you know another tweet that i was going to do yeah have you seen that meme where it's like this guy comes to like progressively bigger realizations and at the end his head explodes I have, so it's yeah. like yeah, the first level is like, oh, I'm going to get paid this much per hour. And then it's going to be, you know, I'm going to get paid this much per year. It's going to be a salary job. To me, the next level down is, well, I'm going to earn uh, money in my sleep. And I'll tell you if, you, if you earn money in your sleep, you know, online or however, then it becomes, well, I'm going to have, you know, even more money coming into my sleep. And then the ultimate level that I want to work towards in my life is to live off the interest. So it's like my lifestyle and it's not going to be a huge lifestyle, but my lifestyle, I want to be able to pay for that lifestyle for me and my family based on the interest of just all the money that I have in the bank. That's my goal. Um, going back to some of the Q and A's that you do on, on Instagram quite often that are quite yeah. popular these days. Um, what is your favorite question and what is your most hated question? I don't really have a favorite question. I say the, the most hated question is what's the difference between uh, football and rugby? Uh, what book should I read? Can I have an internship? Um, what do I think of RPR? Just, you know, all this, all this stuff that's, it's, it's very, very uh, easy to go on Google or to, to use your head. <laughs> and now switching platforms, talking about Twitter. So you, you post yeah. quite a bit and like you, like you mentioned previously about your posts on education, uh, you tend to uh, intentionally or not polarize a little bit on the platform. What, yeah. is, your, what is your intent when you're, when you're posting? What, what goes through your mind? What, what's your goal with it? Um, a friend of mine, you know, this is going back like 10 years. Well, I mean, we've known each other for 20 years almost. We played rugby together at school. And when I first started at Wasps, he was playing Isha. So this is like championship level. And he would come to the Wasps gym after, after work. And I would train him as an intern for money on the side. And he, he got into digital marketing and he's like, you, you need to get on Twitter. And I was like, okay. And one of the things he said is it, the best way to help people on social media is to ask questions. So it's like, oh, how could I help you with this? How could I blah, 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 blah. And to have, to have conversations and ask people. And I've always kind of tried to go into it with that and to, I like to test ideas by speaking to people online. And I like to learn from other people and make connections. Like I've met people from all over the world through social media, which is awesome. And I do, I like a debate. I do like <laughs> uh, winding people up. And also, yeah, it's some people have said to me in the past, you know, like uh, EPL coach said, you're never going to work at this club because you're too controversial on social media. And I was like, but you have heard of me. So it's, it's that it's a double edged sword. In order to be hired as a strength and conditioning coach, people must know you exist. If they don't know you exist, that nothing else matters. They don't care about how how good you are, what your athletes think of you, stuff like that. Because if they don't know, if, if they don't know you exist, you occupy no real estate in their mind. So it's not to be notorious and it's not to say that you have to sell out and be 
and to conduct yourself like a moron and you can think who they are on Twitter, but it is necessary to be known and to occupy real estate in people's minds and to be on the tip of their tongue when it comes to certain topics in order to convey your authority and your knowledge and your usefulness to people, both as a business person and as a coach, because coaching is a business and people pay money for what they feel is useful and good value for money. And it's going to give them a return on the investment of their time, effort and money. Uh, in your opinion, what are most young strength coaches doing wrong when they start out? What could they do better? Not coaching. That's it. <laughs> Not coaching. Somebody said it today. You, you have a person with a master's degree that can read an EMG trace that can't coach a warm up. I saw that one. Yeah. Yeah. Got a coach. Yeah. And um, if you weren't coaching, what would you do for a living? I don't know. That's the problem. I uh, no. People talk about uh, Cortez. Cortez took all the, uh, the conquistadors over to Mexico to colonize Mexico and the Aztecs. And they, they landed the boats and got off the shore. And they'd obviously heard about these like crazy Aztecs that like sacrifice people on pyramids and they're gonna you know, slaughter the conquistadors. And Cortez set fire to the boats. So it was like, burn the boats, the only way is forward. And I, I wrote about that on, I think it was Twitter a few weeks ago there was a point in my internship where I, w I really needed money. I had two or three part-time jobs, had to borrow money if my parents lost money. I went to a call center. So it was like some charity call center. And you were being paid like a commission or if you get a donation, you get whatever. And everyone that I had met at that uh, building they would say, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a singer. I don't really do this. I'm a director. I don't really do this. I'm whatever. I don't really do this. And I thought, but you've been here six years. You do do this. You're not, a, you're not a singer. You're not an actor. You're not stuff like that. And I thought, I actually remember making a decision in my head that I would rather be homeless on the street having failed and giving it my all than to tell myself the lie that, well, I'm not just doing this. So I don't know what I would do. Um, and maybe I got lucky, but maybe that's one reason why I did manage to make it work. I've got a couple last questions for you uh, here today. So first one is, uh, what is your biggest regret in your professional career so far? I don't know if I change anything because it you know, got me this far. If, if I'm saying that I have a regret and I would change something, it means I'm unhappy in the present. And if I'm unhappy in the present, I'll just change something. And, you know, it got me this far. Uh, and last one for the two and a half people that might not know about it. What is Strength Coach Network? It's what I wished I had when I was coming up. So, you know, I described to you how bad I was when I was uh, a new graduate. What was lacking was knowledge, skills, experience, connections, being known, liked and trusted and being able to reach out to people to, to achieve that. And what we try and do is provide an educational platform for coaches where they're exposed to monthly lectures from world-class presenters. So you talk about skin in the game. If you want to make a million dollars, speak to the local business owner, don't speak to an economics professor. So you don't speak to our membership unless you earn your living in the real world, getting results with athletes. We provide a discussion forum so that you can bounce your ideas off people that have gone there before you been there, done it, brought the t-shirt. Um, we also provide strategic career guidance. So how to prepare for a job interview based on people that do interviews themselves, you know, administer interviews, how to prepare for practical tasks, uh, how to reach out to people. We connect people from literally all over the world. And we've also added in this year, uh, the business of coaching. So looking at what steps can you take to be as he said, financially robust to a very unforgiving industry so that if and when the worst happens and it will, you just, you don't feel it and you can just carry on doing what you're going to do anyway. And you can try for a dollar at strengthcoachnetwork.com. I'll uh, link all those in the description. Kira, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thanks so much for your time. Pleasure. Pleasure.